Hello and welcome to coverage of Pro Tour Magic 2015. We're in Portland, Oregon, in the booth. Marshall Sutcliffe, that's me. Zach Hill, that's you. You got it right this we're time. Ready, right? We're ready to head down <laughs> to the feature match area now for Martin Yuza versus Sam Party. Now, vo both of these players need a big finish at this last Pro Tour of our uh, Pro Point season. They both need a top 16 in order to make the highest level possible in the Pro Point Club, which is, of course, Platinum. We are underway very quickly on both sides with uh, <clears throat> Sunblade Elf getting into the red zone here just for one. Selfless Kastar on the other side of the battlefield, but a nice follow-up here, Welkin Turn. Blue-green from Sam Party, not a color pair we see that often in M15, but uh, I'm curious to see how it'll do here. Well, I have to assume he's splashing at least some white mana for that Sunblade Elf. Yeah, looking at his deck. Oh, wait, that's that's Yuza over there who is on uh, green, white, white, green, splash, red. Okay. And then uh, Sam Pardee on green, blue, splashing a single planes. So uh, two, three color decks here. Not something you see that frequently in Corset Limited. Got the full Tron over there. Sam Party, a little, little jab to use it there. You got the full Tron, he says. Oh, wow. <laughs> and that was kind of a setup, I think, because he's about to have that himself. And here comes the planes. I mean, this is Expedition, a really unbelievable card if you can power it out on the third turn. I mean, that is a lot of mana. Now, the question, especially in Limited, is how do you capitalize on it, right? Like, are you enabling some really powerful splashes? Do you have a really high mana curve where now you're going to be able to play things that just overpower your opponent? I think the way that Pardee plans on capitalizing it is casting and resolving Hornet Queen. Wow. Arguably one of the most powerful cards in the entire format. A lot of people say, okay, well, it costs seven mana, but once you cast it, you've stabilized. I think between that and, and Soul of Theros, I think those are the two most just outright powerful cards in this whole set. Hornet Queen. I love Hornet Queen. <laughs> that card is so good. Now we see Seder Wayfinder getting that Evolving Wilds. I actually didn't know Seder Wayfinder could get you non-basic lands. Absolutely, yeah. But, uh, can grab you Nykthoses and uh, Constructed. Maybe we'll see some of that it's later. not too weak. Now, right now, that Sunblade Elf is representing a pump. This is kind of an interesting spot for Yuza. He could block with his Wayfinder and force the issue. Oh, no, it's a 2-2 already. Sorry, excuse me. And uh, so that is definitely not an option. He's going to take four damage here and a Wayfinder now for Sam Party as well. And it's going to show a little bit of what he's got going on. I thought I saw a plummet there in the main deck for Party. This didn't seem like a, a format where I'd want to plummet in the main. Uh, maybe I missed something, though. No, I would tend to agree with you. I mean, I, I've definitely played it before, but it's not something, you know, the format's not necessarily defined, or not even necessarily, it's just not defined by large flyers. On the other hand, a lot of your higher picks are creatures with flying. Uh, I mean, Welcome Turn being a great example. We see Illusory Angel, which is the thing he's got going draft. on. Dragons. But what we're really yeah. seeing, I think, here is a battle between two of the most powerful cards in the entire format. I think maybe even the two best, in my personal opinion. We see Hornet Queen on party side that he's accelerating into, but Spectral Ward from Yuza, the other card that I just always want to see in my first pack. And uh, Yuza probably about to cast it here. Now, unfortunately for Martin, not a great target here. He's got two 1-1s one -ones on the battlefield and making them 3-3s three with protection from all colors. I mean, obviously, a 3-3 three -three with protection from all colors is a strong card, but if Sam just windmills Hornet Queen onto the battlefield, it's not going to do a whole lot. Yeah, I think if you're a user, you want to get that Willforge Golem out there, there start attacking for six, maybe now you're cast talking. Triplicate Spirits this turn if you're not trying to set up the enchantment. You're right that there aren't that many good targets right now. Um, question is whether that golem's going to be able to stick around. Again, both of these players, you know, from a bigger picture perspective, looking to start off 3-0 in this draft and trying to set themselves up to make a run at the top 16 of this tournament. It would be huge for both of them as it would achieve platinum status for the entire next year. Sure. All right, so he decided to go for the triplicate spirits, and there they are. So interestingly, if Yuza chooses to use those spirits to block, 
party can just activate the elf. Yes. Uh, so not really able to hold off Welkin turn terribly successfully. I guess he could just block with two of them. Uh, yeah, he could block with two of them. I mean, then you're trading Welkin turn for two thirds of the spirits. And oh, wow. Sam Party very calmly says, announces his trigger and says, can I get four <laughs> hornets, please, Judge? And that is pretty nasty. As Hornet Queen plus Sunblade Elf is going to be nearly unbeatable here for Party. Martin Yuza certainly has his work cut out for him here. Yikes. I mean, on the other hand, if your opponent's casting Hornet Queen, you want to be casting Triplicate Spirits. Normally, but the, the combo with Sunblade Elf is really, yeah, it's devastating. It's <laughs> yeah, really, really yeah, powerful. Yeah, and uh, Party keeping that Welkin turn around, just keeping as a ton of creatures on the board. It's going to set up a huge attack next turn. Use a Hornet Nest, not quite the same as a Hornet Queen. <laughs> Spectral Ward, just not very many good targets. I like it. Not quite the same as a Hornet not Queen. Not quite either. the same. Not the same magic card. No. <laughs> There's the nest. Sam Party says, yeah. Now, what Yuza is doing is trying to keep green-white up, or just any white mana up, or at least he seemed like it, for the activated ability of the Cather, which can allow his tokens to trade with some of those Hornets, but looks like he prioritizes getting a Golem on the battlefield over being able to use his trick defensively. Oh, man, and, and a top-decked Reclamation Sage from Party. Uh, originally, I thought he was going to into the Void, the Golem, but it looks like he can just kill it if he wants to now. But first things first, get in there with those flyers. Yuza kind of shakes his head a little as uh, this is just such an incredibly difficult board state to actually interact with in a, in a positive way. This is 14 damage in the air for Party if he just activates his elf. So Yuza has to block with at least one of those spirits in order to stay alive. And that elf is really wrecking things right now. Is Yuza splashing for, for some burn spells? Like, uh, can he find some way to kill? I mean, that would at least give him a shot, even then, though, it's probably too late as Party activates the Sunblade Elf. Yeah, he's splashing for double Lightning Strike Inferno Fest. He put the Welkin turn in the bin, but it's not actually dying here because it got pumped as well. And <laughs> another essential two for one here for Sam Party, and I think we're going to be done. There we go. Sam Party takes down the first game in impressive yeah, fashion really with a, uh, a Hornet Queen yeah, and a Sunblade Elf. There's a lot. It's kind of messed up. All right, we're going to jump over to one of our side matches after these messages. Outfit your Magic collection with the newest Magic 2015 core set accessories from Ultra Pro. You can see the full array of card sleeves, deck boxes, playmats, and portfolios of your favorite magic artwork at ultrapro.com. Play magic at a store near you every Friday. Earn Planeswalker points and battle against your friends in Friday Night Magic. August's FNM promo is Bioblight. Visit wizards.com slash FNM for more information. All right, let's take a live look in here at our side table. Do believe that that is Josh McLean versus Jacob Wilson. And yes, indeed. Battle of the teammates here. Flooded board. Lots of permanency. Two frost links. The vampire. Some crows. Wow, this Menagerie. is just a really, really flooded out board. But I see a couple of key permanents here on Jacob Wilson's side. I see a soul of Innistrad and an ancient silverback. So I'm assuming those are bigger than anything that Josh has going on. And then I also see two netcaster spiders, which I'm assuming are holding down the fort here. Yeah, I would absolutely agree with that assessment. I know we heard Chris Finnell, I think it was, talking about, oh, he wants to be able to pass Soul of Innistrad, but when you do actually cast it, and it is actually on the board. <laughs> Not a bad magic card. Now, this is getting ugly, though. There's a roaring Primadox that is kind of going off here <laughs> That's right. for Jacob. Do you see what he's doing? 
I know he's got the shaman that he can yes, pick up. Shaman I'm trying to see what else is. And he's picking that up and recasting it. And you see how much mana he has available here. He's got 10 mana. So casting a shaman to spring every turn and drawing an extra card, no big deal for him at this point. He also gets to attack with his two six power creatures that are just really tough to tussle with in combat. One of them, of course, having regeneration and the other one with death touch. So even if you stack up a bunch of blockers, you'll lose them all. Yeah, Silverback. Yuck. Not, not really. I mean, you really need to cast Flesh to Dust on Ancient Silverback or have a chump blocker available every single turn. Yep. Now, interesting, Josh McClain is in black. He does have access to Flesh to Dust potentially. Seder Wayfinder. All right. Another card he can pick up with that Roaring Primadox yes, if he needs to but save it, some mana. And, and also he can start using his Soul of Innistrad here to start generating huge amounts of card advantage because he needed more. <laughs> <laughs> and he plays Invasive Species, picks up a land, and he's got a Typhoid Rats as well. So Jacob Wilson, even though the boards look pretty cluttered on both sides, seems to have a bit of a card draw engine going in. Looks like from where we're at here, he's going to be able to take over. All right, Research Assistant gets activated. The slowest looter ever. But it does get active. I've activated that thing more, more times than I'd care to admit here, Zach. Well, again, that's the thing, is that four mana to loot is not great, but four mana when you're in a board stall, you don't really care how much you're spending. You just need to get rid of excess lands. Yeah. And I think that, you know, the key thing to remember about that card is that you play it because it's a 1-3 for two mana. Right. You have to get yourself out of the mindset of, it's a looter. Well, exactly, because what you're planning on doing with that card is not just using it turn after turn after turn like you were with some of the other you know, literal merfolk looter, for right. example. You're planning on using it you know, two or three times in a game to just draw yourself out of a stall. You know, sometimes you can use it like you can here, can here to dig for answers, but that's not what it's best at doing. Right, so that's what, that's what Josh is using it for right now, and boy, does he need some pretty special answers. I mean, we're talking about, what, in Garrick's Wake here, or, I, you know, <laughs> there's not a lot of cards that get somebody out of this scenario. And even then, that Soul of Innistrad out of the graveyard can help him. I, I, this is going to be a really tough one for Josh to actually win. It looks like it'll take a little while, but... I have a feeling here that, that Josh McLean is going to be able to, uh, is not going to be able to, to get through the avalanche of cards yeah. available. It looks like he's trying to figure out an attack, but there just aren't very many good <clears throat> options right now. All right, well, we'll let this one finish up. And uh, why don't we head back to our main feature match between Martin Yuza and Party Time. <laughs> Sam Party, that's how he goes. <laughs> is that how he goes? That, he does, yes. Wouldn't you? <laughs> if I enjoyed such a dominant last name, I think I might have to. Go right. Hey, pair of forests for both players to kick things off and a Sungrace Pegasus for Martin Yuza. And it's met its match with the welcome turn here. Let's see if there's a trade offered and if that offer is accepted. I yep. see that there's a plummet in hand for Martin Yuza. He could fire it off on the welcome turn now. But instead, he's going to attack, and Party's just going to take it. Yeah, a lot of tricks in Yuza's hand, it looks like. Ranger Scout, Plummet, Hunt the Weak, that Siege Worm not entering the battlefield anytime soon. Meanwhile, on Party's side, we have Peel from Reality, Research Assistant, Invasive Species. Ooh, look at this. Plummet in response to inv invasive, invasive Species means that Sam Party now has to pick up a land. Yeah, that's huge. That could set him way behind here. Yeah, that sets him back an entire turn. I mean, Party has cheap spells in his hand, and okay. that Invasive Species is a 3-3, actually pretty relevant right now, because, again, Yuza not going to be doing very much for a while, but it still buys Yuza some valuable time. And if Yuza had a, a creature to cast there, he could set up Siege Worm for the next turn, but he doesn't. Unless maybe he has a Raise the Alarm or something. What's in his hand? Hunt the Weak Ranger's Gall Siege Worm? Yeah, no, that's not going to do it. And like you said, Sam Party benefiting from the fact that he's got a relatively low mana curve, and he's able to actually play two creatures on just that third mana and also try to keep himself from getting overwhelmed here. The, the good... Or, Maybe I shouldn't say overwhelmed in this particular <laughs> Right, not literally overwhelmed. 
but from getting uh, overran. <laughs> <laughs> but like I said, Martin Yuza not really uh, committing enough to the board to make that happen anyway with just the Sun Grace Pegasus there on offense. Oh, we see in Party's hand another appearance of our friend, the Carnivorous Moss Beast. Uh, uh, yes. Not going to come out for a while. Uh, meanwhile, so are we going to see Hunt the Weak here to take down the Sunblade Elf? That's what I would assume. Uh, we cut away, but uh, that's that's got to be what happened. Yeah, Sunblade Elf in the bin and it's, extra damage and life gain there for Yuza. Yeah, that was actually a really big moment of this match. Sure. Party playing the 1-1 one, one Sunblade Elf while it was vulnerable. That meant that Hunt the Weak had a target, and it means that that Pegasus now represents a four-point life swing every turn. Not only a bigger offensive threat, but can stabilize Yuza against that invasive species. Really big Hunt the Weak. What's plural of species, Zach? I think it's species. Okay, so we've got two of them now. <laughs> Don't quote me on that. However you look at it. I'm sure Twitter will inform us what the plural of species is. So six power and six toughness on Sam Party's side of the table. I'm hearing from Rashad that uh, Jacob Wilson actually was able to get that match. He's up 1-0. Seemed like that one was in the books. Don't know how you beat that. Maybe a mind sculpt? <laughs> <laughs> Always got to look for the other axes of interaction. So I think, uh, is, is Yuza tanking right here over just whether to cast Siege Worm or whether to attack? Oh, more hunts He's the week. He's got more, so now... Oh, wow, man. Wow, this Pegasus is oh, some serious goodness. work. And he gets to kill his species and now attack. That is sad. The good news is we don't need to worry about what the plural is anymore because we've only got one. <laughs> I mean, this is big. I mean, Yuzo just really all in on the Pegasus plan. He yes. keeps Ranger's Guile up. So Wait. Sam Party, we know that he has Peel from Reality, but it just doesn't Thanks. matter. And Yuzo knows that he can just ride this Pegasus to victory. I mean, he's basically built himself an Exalted Age, you know, a, a big lifelink flyer out of what was originally a 1-2. Yep, and here it goes. This is going to prompt a Ranger Skyle from Martin Yuza. This and is, is and Peel is still going to bounce the assistant, right? Yeah, I think that's the way it works. This still gets bounced, right? Yeah, because yeah, 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 it'll try to do all of it. So, wow, the tempo setbacks on Sam Party are getting nasty. They're even happening from his own deck at this point, which is pretty brutal. And that Pegasus now hitting for four damage that turn, meaning that all of these hit. I mean. Party has hit Martin with the invasive species like three or four times, and Martin's still at a healthy 24 life. Yeah, here's the, the big hitter, the carnivorous moss beast, back in the feature match area. He would not be denied. <laughs> and there's a Kinsville <laughs> skirmisher to pump even further. Yuza just has every synergy imaginable with the Pegasus. Yes. Imagine if Party had plummet and just had killed the Pegasus. <laughs> Be a very different match. Yes. I mean, those Hunt the Weeks get so much worse. He's got to try to find a creature. Playing him a lot later in the game. But this is a big hit. Like, let's not forget here, even though Sam Party's down to five, he is attacking for seven damage here. Martin Hughes has gained a ton of life over the course of this game, so he's not in danger anytime soon. But if Party can find a way to stabilize against the uh, Pegasus itself, he's actually going to be in a pretty decent position, having just straight up a much bigger creature on the battlefield. And the thing I'm thinking about is what if Party had just not played the Sunblade Elf? Then there wouldn't mm. have been a good target for Hunt the Week, and I can't imagine Yuza would have played Hunt the Week as a four-mana sorcery speed, put a plus-one, plus-one counter on a creature. I mean, it wouldn't have worked anyway. Well, I think he could have targeted the research assistant. Oh, that was on the battlefield? Yeah. Okay, sure. Oh, wow. Okay, oh, here no, we that's go. That's big. Into the Void, both of your creatures. Now, this is going to change everything. I was just saying, if, if Party can find a way to stabilize, this could give him the route to actually start taking huge chunks out of Yuza's life total. And he does right there. I think he just hit for seven more damage. But I, I think Yuza has Lightning Strike in his hand, so if he just uses it to go to, to Party's dome just as opposed to on a him? creature, yeah. Although he, he passes the turn, doesn't cast it, so it gives Party a turn to draw a counter spell. Now, what's the thinking here? I think Is he hoping that Sam Party will tap out on a bunch of his mana here? Maybe so. Maybe you just get more information if you're Yuza for game three. If you sure. know you have it locked, he's going to activate the research assistant, so he might show you something. 
That's fair. Also, he's just got lethal in the air anyway. Right. He's at 21, so there's no shenanigans that can get him out of this. Yeah, it's, this is actually just super safe for him. I mean, you don't want to get it countered, but when you can win two different ways, it's pretty good. Martin's going to play it ultra right. safe and chump block here. Also, there's no reason to show that your red splash yes, is for lightning totally. strike. Yep, completely safe play there from Yuza. No need to be in a hurry there. There is no combination of cards that could kill him, so he's going to be patient with it and use it as a backup plan, which he ends up not needing. So Martin Yuza ties things up here, and that's going to force a game three. Why don't we jump over to uh, one of our other matches here and check in on what's going on with, I think, Josh McLean versus uh, Jacob Wilson. And these are both at our feature match area, Battles of the Teammates. We see Melissa versus Pierre Dijon. They're both on Team Rev Revolution. And then Josh McLean and Jacob Wilson, both on Team Face-to-Face -face Games. Uh, we are seeing so many three-color decks. A lot of splashing. You know, when you put Evolving Wilds in meteorite floating around it does tempt people to splash for sure right and then the cycle of what people call current apes the uncommon creatures that are one color but they want you to have a basic land of another color plus a really solid activated ability like we saw with sunblade elf the incentive is there to try and make those work so it looks like not an amazing board state quite yet we, last time we checked in on these two players they had a ridiculous board state going now a little more pedestrian here. <laughs> Got it pared down a bit. But I like this. This is a little bit more of the developing middle stages of the game here. Both players look like they're on five mana currently. Yeah, not a lot of action happening. Both no, there's players. a Living Totem and a Seder Wayfinder, but can you tell what's underneath that dice? I can't quite see it. I also can't see so, it. Yeah, gonna, oh, it's, it's the Toad. Uh, two, three for three. Oh, which is familiar? Yeah, which okay. is familiar. But yeah. this one's a three, four, so a very, very big toad. Maybe a frog. I don't want to upset the... It's a frog. <laughs> Whoever's keeping the taxonomy out there. Yeah, it's a, Alligators, it's a frog, crocodiles, yeah. toads, right. frogs. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, the thing in a board state like this is that a lot can go wrong, but only a few things can go right, so... He's able to give a creature flying with a paragon if he wants to, but... And he does. And he's also going to give his other creature flying here as well. So, looks like Josh McLean is looking to uh, assert victory as soon as possible wow. here, but ouch. And that's Flesh massive. Dust says no. Because he pays two life for the vampire anyway. Yes. Only taking two damage and essentially has to tap all of his creatures. Ooh, here's oh, another big. potential win that condition. That is big. Though. Stab wound on the frog, so which is familiar, gets stabbed and is gonna start bleeding out here, and that is gonna be a big issue going forward. We saw how grindy the deck is for, for Jacob Wilson, where he's trying to eke out a card here and draw an extra card there and return something and draw a card, but it looked pretty slow. He was able to get on board last game, but that stab wound says, you don't have forever this time. That's true. If he is able to take Ooh. either an invasive species or a primate ox, it does mean he gets to blank the stab wound. I just saw Nissa in his hand. Oh, my goodness. Oh, man. Not bad. No, not even slightly. <clears throat> so Wilson leaving back the living totem to protect Bang! Nissa. There's Nissa. Oh, what a temp. What a play. Wow. So he untapped his forest, replayed invasive species, took the frog back to his hand, and in the process, knocked off Stab Wound. Huge turn for Jacob Wilson, and he's very nicely left himself with Living Totem and an invasive species sitting there to protect Nyssa. Right, meaning that if Wilson wants to threaten Nyssa, he's going to need to activate his Paragon. If, if Josh wants to. Sorry, if Josh wants to, no that's right. Activate the Paragon, hit Nyssa for two, figure out a way to deal Nyssa two more damage, <laughs> and then also recover from having taken essentially your entire turn off to deal with the Planeswalker once you're staring down six points of damage and a Witch's Familiar in your opponent's hand. Yikes. It doesn't sound very good when you put it that way. No, it does not. I, after that stab wound, I was like, okay, Josh in a pretty commanding position, but a little bit different. A lot can happen in a turn of a Magic game. Especially when a Planeswalker hits the battlefield. That <laughs> tends to be a particularly... 
game warping play. Josh also stuck just on the one island, so giving his aeronaut tinkerer flying could potentially cut him off of blue mana for an entire turn. He's not doing that. He's going to play a Frost Lynx and attack with Tinkerer at Josh. Did he say, uh, excuse me, at uh, Jacob? Did he say you? I did not hear him. He's tapped out. Uh, and that Tinker is a 3 4. Yes. So. So the life totals must be getting very relevant here as uh, we see a chump lock there. All right, so why don't we head back over to our main feature match, though? We'll have to let those two gentlemen <clears throat> battle it out on their own because we've got game three. Martin Yuza versus Sam Party. Yuza used a, a Sun Grace Pegasus that was highly modified and rode it to victory in game two. <laughs> a modified Pegasus. Did That's it right. have rims? It did. It was modded. <laughs> <laughs> significantly and uh sam party nothing on turn one or two but he does have a a plummet here oof he's got to go for the invasive species though and pick up a land so another big tempo hit he never really recovered from that in the previous game and yuza has got living totem to put a counter on yeah. his pegasus and the mods begin yeah. early I mean, that's one of the reasons I think Pegasus is just such a high pick in this format. It's a fine card anyway. And then if you just do anything to it, uh, getting, that, getting those shenanigans out of the way super fast. But All right, so Sam Party replays his third land, does not attack. He needs to play defense right now, but he does use his plummet on his turn to take out the Pegasus. And you'll see that sometimes it's correct to wait till the last second to use your removal, but other times it's much better to make sure that the thing dies. He knows what can happen if that Pegasus gets out of, gets out of hand. Do you have other courage? <laughs> no comment. No comment from party. That'd be, that'd be sick. Good card. It is. Gather courage is a trick that party could play here for no mana, giving his species plus two plus two, which would blow Yuza out if Yuza tries to activate the selfless cather once party blocks but no blocks there from sam party and land 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 lightning strike for martin yuza okay let's see if party can get things moving back in the right direction here he's needed to use a few turns to get the invasive species down that cost him the land drop then he needed to use a turn to get the uh, Sun Grace Pegasus off the battlefield and hasn't really been able to do much else and land for a go here from Party. So we see use a with Spectra Ward. That can allow him to hit for four points of damage. Party at 15, but Hardy has Reclamation Sage in his hand. So Ward not going to be as big of a problem in this game as it theoretically could be. Yeah, this is one spot where Yuza, I don't think he's that worried about playing around Peel from reality, though, because <laughs> right. if Party wants to Peel, he's going to set him back miles further. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think you go for Ward here. I mean, hitting for four, taking your opponent to 11, it's just really good. You can keep attacking with that totem because you've got Selfless Cather on the battlefield. If you draw some lands, Boon Weaver Giant, presumably there's a target other than Spectral Ward somewhere. Yeah, and, and, and when is Ward going to be better than right now but i mean it looks like he's pretty conservative around that yeah just actually just full on says go so party gets a reprieve from the attacks here for a turn and finds a sunblade elf though no planes yet for sam party right sunblade elf not the awesomest is a one one inferno fist from yuza not that many targets for inferno fist so i can see yuza just okay i'm gonna play some lands I'm going to play Boon Weaver Giant, make you deal with it, maybe be able to bait the Reclamation Sage into blowing whatever Giant gets, but no, nah, it looks like he's ready to pull the trigger. Sure. For four, right? yeah. And waiting a turn allows him to have a mana up, bluffing Ranger's Guile, and that might make Party say, okay, well, then why did he wait a turn? If he right. Well, but yeah, I guess no, but you can't target it with Ranger's Guile anyway. So Yuza just evidently having a change of game plan once he saw Inferno Fest. Back to use the Sam Party down to 11 life here. 
on Evolving Wilds, actually a big drawback this turn for Yuza. It's, it's preventing him from casting Boonweaver Giant this turn. Yeah. Now the other end, Party doesn't really have a lot of pressure, not even a white mana for the Sunblade Elf, so Yuza not in a particular need to hurry up. I wonder if Yuza has any more targets beyond the Spectre Ward and the Inferno Fest. That's what I'm curious about, too. Do we have his list that you yeah, can I'm look at here? Yeah, I'm going to dig that up. Pretty lame when you draw your, your last target <laughs> the turn before you can cast your giant. So, yeah, Spectral Ward there. Which is his best one. Inferno Fist. And... Yeah, it doesn't look like he has anything else. He's got a Verdant, or yeah, Verdant Haven works for Avison's uh, Pilgrim, or but uh, or Heliod's Pilgrim, but not for Verdant Haven, and he's not main decking it anyway. So that Boonweaver Giant, just a four-four creature. All right, so back on the board here with Party, he's got a Juggernaut, two cards left in his hand, seven mana on the battlefield, even after having been forced to basically skip a land drop. So Party's back. And there's Boonweaver Giant. You get it from your graveyard? Oh, you can get it from your graveyard, Zach. Oh, my Remember? goodness. You can get it from your hand, oh, library, that is or graveyard. Huge. Yes. Oh, wow. I did not uh, yeah, realize it's, that. It's the Pilgrim that searches your library. Oh, that's So that's the one you don't want to draw your last one. But on the Boonweaver Giant, you can get it from anywhere. Oh, that is so You don't powerful. see that on the, on the battlefield too often. The Boonweaver Giant costs seven. Uh, it's an uncommon, but here it is. And wow. All right, so Selfless Cathar and Reclamation Sage are going to be returned, and then he's going to yeah. replay uh, the Sage to once again Focus. take down the Spectre Award. So use a trying to get that thing on the battlefield and Sam Party disallowing it at every opportunity. Yeah, that is a pretty advanced play. Now, and, this is interesting. And in comes Juggernaut. Yeah, and, and Yuza cashing in the Wayfinder for five life, but Yuza has Hornet's Nest. So he knows that he's going to have an answer to that Juggernaut. It's actually going to be really good. Hilariously, Hornet's Nest has Defender, is not a wall. Is not a wall, it's exactly. Yeah. yeah. It feels so wrong. It's like you're not <laughs> supposed to be able to block this, but no, it's, it's wall specific. So it looks like Yuza just really wanting to preserve his life total given uh, the Sunblade Elf on the table and, and how much damage that can stack up. Maybe trying to figure out if he wants to attack with giants. How much time do you want to give Sam Party to find the white mana to make the Sunblade Elf active, right? Yeah, I agree. I, I really like attacking with giant here. Yeah, it doesn't. Frankly, I like attacking with both giant and totem, I think. So Yuza has enough mana to announce Inferno Fist. Activate it with a ready as open and still play Hornet's Nest. I mean, Hornet's Nest is about the best possible card to cast when your opponent has a juggernaut that he has to attack with. It next is turn. fantastic. Here's Inferno Fist. He's trying to decide where it goes. Yeah. Okay. And it looks like. It goes on the totem. So both creatures hit the red zone. Sam Party's at 11. Fairly high life total, but doesn't want to throw away any damage here. That Inferno of Fist makes double blocking either of the creatures just a lot trickier. If Party blocks with the invasive species, Yuza still can activate Selfless Cather. Although that prevents him from playing Hornet's Nest. Still at 22 life, he doesn't have to worry that much about taking a single hit from the Juggernaut. All right, here's the big triple block, though. On the totem. Martin has to now decide how he wants to one, right? order the blocker. It is currently a one one yeah. Four, three. Let's, so let's listen in to see how... Sorry, 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 sorry. It's okay. Yeah, 
one through three. So first, second, third? Yeah. Okay. Yuza has a lot of options right here. You can go to the dome with Inferno Fist, play a Hornet's Nest and just try to kill Party in the air. He can sack the Cather. He okay. can sack Inferno Fist. Yeah, they trade you, they clash. All right, just clean up the board. Everything trades. It's actually it's really just one. ends up being a three for three after all is said and done. A very, very good one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fan party echoes Zach Hill's yeah. sentiments. Oh, zero, zero. Zero. Yeah, sorry. That was actually what I meant. <laughs> yeah. All right. I will elect to block. Uh, this doesn't actually die, right? The, 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 the nest itself doesn't have death touch. I have a fly with them. Even if it did, it only dealt right. zero. So, I mean, basically build your own Hornet Queen there for Yuza. Yep. Play that thing. Yeah. Glacial Crasher, likely a piece of sideboard technology against Yuza's Mountains. So, I mean, pretty substantial board on party's side. Yeah, he's not done bad. Ten power. and Hornet Queen down. Wow, a miss on the Seder Wayfinder. And Hornet Queen hits the bin for him, too, so that out yeah. isn't going to get there. Yeah. And that's going to do it. Kinsbale Skirmisher pumps a Hornet. He sends all of them into the red zone. And Martin Yuza wins I have a lot of bounce and yeah, that's two true. games to one yeah, over Sam Pardee. You might be right. You having the, you having the Queen like gives, you, gives you an edge. Like, I'm, I'm like the, the destroy effect for that. Yeah. So great stuff from our feature match area there versus two uh, hardcore GP grinders. I mean, Martin also has two PT top eights too, so you know nothing to scoff at there. Um, but really, really great more uh, limited action here in our first three rounds. Yeah, I mean, I've been really interested at how deftly the players have been able to deal with Spectral Ward, commonly accepted as you know one of the probably three most powerful rares in the set. But we saw a Party able to deal with it not once but twice. Two times, yep, and uh, we've seen we've seen a bit of that uh, over and over. We also saw uh, Andrew Cuneo play it and didn't win, right? You know, as a result. So yeah, you know, the card is definitely ha carries a little bit of risk to it, perhaps, but uh, it is one of the hardest cards to deal with in the format for sure. Um, but yeah, that was some pretty intense stuff for the first three rounds. There's a lot on the line here this weekend. Uh, you, we're going to be bringing you storylines throughout the course of the weekend about it, but the key thing to remember here is that this is the last event of the Pro Tour season. Right. So these Pro Points that are up for grabs are the ones that determine whether the players get to Platinum, get to Silver, get to Gold, if they get to keep playing at the Pro Tour level as we go into the next uh, season, which is, I mean, it's you know, pushing a year long here. So it's a big deal to these players, and th a lot of them have a certain goal to finish in the Top 100, in the Top 16, to try to hit that next uh, level. Yeah, and I mean, this year, you know, the, the point thresholds are a little bit higher, but remember, this is an additional Pro Tour. You know, this is yes, one Yes, this extra. is the fourth Pro Tour. We are here. So, I mean, uh, you know, in addition to the Pro Point stakes, I mean, this is just one of the most valuable Pro Tour seasons in Pro Tour history, certainly within recent memory. So, you know, those Pro levels translate to even more Pro Tours and even more money than we've seen in quite some time. Yeah, so. it's, it's a huge deal, and uh, we're going to be keeping you up to date on what's going on as we go through the weekend because there's a lot of interesting races, a lot of interesting interactions, but I kind of like when we get to touch on it here in the booth and also, of course, down in the actual feature match area as the players are literally playing right now for potentially what they're going to be doing for the next year. There's so much more on the line on the last Pro Tour of the season. Uh, at the beginning of the season, there's hope, right? You know, anything could happen. But here, the deadline has come. And right. you need a certain amount of pro points to hit the thresholds. And if you don't, I mean, it can be life-changing in one way or the other for these players. They can take a different path, or sometimes they can be like, I'm a full-time Magic pro now. And, and that really is what, I mean, well, you know, we, we use all these words like platinum, gold, silver. What does that mean? Platinum basically means you can be a full-time Magic player and get by very well. So... Big moments for a lot of these guys. Yeah. Why don't we head down to the to the feature match area where Rashad has an interview with Martin Yuza. All right, I'm Rashad Miller. And I'm here with I'm here with Martin Yuza. How are you doing? Pretty good so far. That's so great. Good. That's great to hear. Now, we saw a lot of three color decks here in the feature match area. Now, is that is that a regular strategy that you guys are going for, or how does that really? <laughs> I, I see you winching your, your, your mouth. How, how did you end up that third color? Not usually. Uh, the draft was just like pretty weird. I didn't know what colors were, were being passed to me. And then it, like I got past a super good rare in the second pack, the, the protection from everything guard. So I just like 
went in, into white because that card is close to unbeatable in this format. And then I'm pretty much just splashing red for two lightning strikes because that card is just very good even even on turn two and even on turn eight. So pretty easily splashable. And I'm splashing one Inferno Fist, which I can fetch with the white one, two, and the the seven mana giant. So it's, it's pretty much a green white deck with, with some splash for removal. All right, so we've been keeping an eye out for what's at stake for all of you pro players out there. Oh, yeah. So what what is it that you're trying? You're trying to chase down platinum. What do you need to get that? I've been platinum or, or level eight for like the last five years, and this season hasn't been very good for me. So right now I'm at 31 points, and I need either top 16 to lock up platinum again, or just get top 100 to get gold at least, which gets you tickets and you know qualifications for the PTs and stuff. But I, I, I certainly would, wouldn't mind top 16 the PT to get the to platinum status again because you know that's a lot of money and stuff, and that definitely helps in definitely helps you like you know travel the world and play the game. And yeah. Do you have your eyes set out for Sifka and and that? Uh, no, the not, not really. He's like 20 more more points than me. I'm happy for him. I'm happy that he's doing well. Uh, he's platinum again this season. He's gonna play the players champs. He's a really good player, so he definitely des deserves that. And we're definitely not like racing each other for like you know a World Cup slot. It, it would be sweet, but there's still the three qualifi qualifications in like ne next week, so you know anything can happen. All right. Well, thank you, Martin User. I'm Rashad Miller, and we're gonna send it back to the booth. Hey guys, welcome back to the booth. So you, you heard it from Martin. He needs to top 16 to get back to platinum, which is kind of where he's used to being uh, at the pro level. Uh, Sam Pardee is in the same exact uh, spot. He needs to get a top 16 as well. So Martin, well on his way, we'll have to keep an eye on, him, eye on him as we go through. But for now, let's head back over to the news desk and Rich Hagen. Thanks very much to Marshall Sutcliffe and Zach. He'll bring you all the limited action here at Pro Tour Magic 2015. Now, a huge result has come in. Dazani against Duke, the player of the year race, Hoyun Choi was the third round opponent of Jeremy Dizani. For the third round running, Dizani goes two and zero. He did not drop a game in draft. He is off to the races at three and zero, along with round about 45 to 50 other players who will get to three and zero. But Alex Rochette was Reed Duke's third round opponent. They got to one and one. Rochette won game three, and that means that Reed Duke falls to one and two in his draft. He was three and three uh, in draft um, at Pro Tour born of the gods and now one and two coming out of the first draft here tough times but we go into standard next so uh, that's uh, the player of the year race i can tell you one result just came in i just saw go by for british fans neil rigby was at 2-0 and o, played against raf levy of france at 2-0 and o. levy took game three a tight one and so levy the hall of famer goes to 3-0 and o. he is trying to get to platinum this weekend Neil Rigby at two and one in his 12th Pro Tour. All right, it's time for some draft conversation. What have we learned this morning? What have we seen from our drafts that we've seen and hundreds of matches played out over the course of the morning? What do we need to know for tomorrow? We're gonna to head across to the comfy chairs on the far side of the news desk studio. Here is Brian David Marshall sitting with Hall of Famer, Mr. Ben Stark. Thanks, Rich. All right, Ben, people at home want to know about your draft. Uh, so we could tell them uh, the draft, your, your three rounds didn't go great for you. You ended up going one and two. You mm. lost a heartbreaker on camera. Yeah, I lost some really, another one of those same type of games this round, game one. I mean, just really close games, just didn't really bounce my way. How, how happy would you say you were with your deck when, uh, when, when the last card was picked? Not too happy. Uh, it didn't really come together. Like, I think it was a fine deck. I would, but I was trying to really get the token synergies, and uh, ha I already had the finishers, like the hard part, so I was really looking for Seder Wayfinders and Raise the Alarms, and there really just wasn't much. Okay, so let's, let's go back to that first pack. And, and this is, you know, you, you open it up, and there's one of, like, just, there's a couple of the best cards in the format. Yeah. Cone of Flame, Triplicate Spirits, and, you know, a, 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 an actual bomb in Siege Dragon. Yeah. How, how, how do you process that pack? And are there any other cards you even looked at there? Yeah, there weren't any other cards that I looked at that I can remember. But all three of those are good cards. All three are first pickable. Uh, I think the Siege Dragon's the worst of the three just because it costs seven mana. I think people uh, still think a little too much about how a card performs in a stalemate or just envision these six and seven mana cards taking over boards. 
And limited these days is more like constructed. It's more about hitting your curve and having synergy. And you know, you've probably got some, some ways to push through at the end. You know, But that said, Siege Dragon is a first pickable card. I like to personally think of cards uh, on like a 1 to 10 scale, with 5 being around replacement and uh, 6 being something that adds some value. 7 is usually around first pickable. 8 is like a good first pick. 9 and 10 are like windmill slam type cards. I wouldn't consider uh, any of them windmill slams, but I would consider Cone the best of the three. Cone of Flame is probably about an 8.5 to 9 on that scale. It's, it's the card that I consider the best. Triplicate Spirits is in second, about an 8. It's the best common in the set. And it's so good because if you drew lands, you can just attack with guys and then play it for four or five mana, whatever. If you're stuck on two or three, you can just tap your guys to cast it. So it's not like some bombs where it sits in your hand when you're stuck on lands. You can convoke is like uh, really a great ability for limited because if you're like me and you prioritize low curve and you're generally taking a lot of two drops and three drops and whatnot, I, I really love for my expensive spells to have convoke because if I'm stuck on three or four lands, two or three lands, whatever, I can convoke it out. Anyways, that said, uh, I would consider Cone about an 8.5 to a 9, the best card. I would consider Triplicate Spirits the second best card about an 8, and I would consider Siege Dragon about a 7. Still first okay. pickable. Not, nothing crazy, but a first pickable card. Um, so, I mean, I don't think the difference... So obviously, you know I'm not going to take Siege Dragon then, because right. why would I take it if it's worse than Cone and they're the same color? Um, and it's pick one, pack one. You know, Sometimes you take a worse card, pack one, because it's an artifact and you can play it in any deck. But there's, or, you, or cards get better and worse later in the draft based on what you already have. But pick one, pack one. Obviously, why would I take a red card that I consider to be about a seven over a red card I consider to be about a nine? That doesn't right. make sense. Yeah, yeah. So the pick is between Triplicate Spirits and Kona Flame. And I went with the Triplicate Spirits. And the reason being there were two good red cards and only one good white card. I don't concern myself that much with what I'm passing because people tend to stick to their picks and you never really know what the people that you're passing are going to play. But when it's... Cards that are close, like Triplicate Spirit and Kona Flame, I'll go ahead and take a card that's only a little bit worse because there's t the next best card is Rat. Let's say it was Kona Flame, Siege Dragon, and Raise the Alarm. I would never take Raise the Alarm there because there's two good red cards. I would just take Kona Flame because Raise right. the Alarm is... It, and Raise the Alarm I like a lot, but it's too much worse than Kona and Flame to make a pick like that. Right. When it's Triplicate Spirit, a card I only consider a little bit worse than Kona and Flame, then I think it can be right in, and I think was right in this right. situation. And so, and what, what are you expecting? What I mean, you know that Sam is a uh, you know very skilled drafter. Mm -hmm. uh, what what are you expecting him to take from what you're sending to him? Well, I think he knows I took triplicate spirits because I took a common over Conan play. It's it's pretty obvious. Yeah, because there's some formats where the second best common is almost as good as the first best common, the third is almost as good as the second and first, whatever. This isn't one of those formats. Right. Triplicate spirits is way better. Like the second best common in the format is probably lightning strike, and right. it is not even close to triplicate spirits. You know. <laughs> I mean, Lightning Strike is around a seven, Triplicate Spirits is around an eight. But like, for, firstly, that like, there's a big difference on like from each one on those power, you know, on my power scale. And secondly, like, Lightning Strike is like a low seven, if anything, and Triplicate Spirits, you know, is just really good. Like, Triplicate Spirits is the best common by at least a whole point on my one to ten scale, you know. <laughs> okay. So you you take a Triplicate Spirits. What what do you want your deck to look like? What colors do you want to be? Mm. And, and what do you want to have happen in the draft? Well, ideally, you're going to play white and get to play the triple good spirits. It's not like a great splash card. Yeah. Because, I mean, it's double white. I mean, it's fine if white isn't your base color because you, you only need one planes and you can convoke it out with a white guy. But it's not like you're going to draft a blue-green deck and pick up an Evolving Wilds and then splash your triple good spirits. So you're hoping to play white. Uh, I'm not big on forcing my first pick. Even when it's a card like Triplicate Spirit, it's a really good card. I'm still just going to draft green-red if that's what I see after this. Actually, I mean, red is kind of a little off the table because of the, the right, Siege right. Dragon and the Conan Flame. Right, right. But, I mean, I would still play red if I got past a card like Conan Flame. I actually did get past a Heat Ray, but that that's not Conan Flame. You know what I mean? Right, right. I, that's like an okay card. So, I mean... I was not going to... I was hoping to not play red. I was hoping to play white. And... Uh, you know, your de triplicate spirits are good in any white deck. I mean, there's right. not like a specific way your deck has to look. Obviously, when you already have a triplicate spirits, you're interested in sanctified charge or uh, overwhelm or um, other convoke cards because you can cast them so cheap after you put right. the spirits out. Um, so o overwhelm a card, you know, normally that overrun effect, you get trample on it. This mm -hmm. doesn't offer that, but you still make it work by just having because you're a Convoke deck and because you're a token deck, you just have so many more well, creatures that it works Yeah, you. Overwhelm like, is not a great card in a lot of draft decks in this sure. format. It's like a combo card. It's like if you're token synergy, then the card is fantastic. If you've got a deck like Green-White with Seder Wayfinder and Raise the Alarm and Triplicate Spirits and uh, 
forget the name, uh, the shaman, the four mana two two. Reclamation. Oh, um, the. Yeah. Yeah, he draws a card. You got all these uh, creatures with comes into play effects and token making and whatnot. Overwhelming, overwhelm is busted in that deck. Right. But in a green red deck that had lightning strike and siege dragon and other green fatties, I wouldn't even want an overwhelm necessarily. Right. Okay. Uh, I think the you know a lot of people on on Twitter when I when we were watching the draft live you know had a strong reaction yeah. to the cone of flame cone of flame, but I think the other pick which came in pack three, uh, maybe your second pick I think mm -hmm. of 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 pack three is Juggernaut. Over soul of uh, new Phyrexia. soul of new Phyrex soul of new Phyrexia. A yeah. lot of people have been asking me about that. I mean, to start, I think people think soul is better than it is. Uh, soul of new Phyrexia doesn't have reach, doesn't have flying, um, doesn't have indestructible. It, you can pay five to get things indestructible. Right. But so your opponent can reclamation sage it, naturalize it, bounce it, you know, kill it, you know, whatever, pillar it. You know, there's a lot of cards that interact very favorably against it. Right. Still a good card. Yeah. But that takes it from a ten to an eight, in my opinion. Okay. You know, it's it's a good first pick. It's not a windmill slam first pick sure. or something like that. That said, Juggernaut is not even that. Juggernaut, sure. around a six on my scale. A little above re replacement. Sure. I think Juggernaut adds positive value to your deck, but I don't even think it's really a first pick. Like, But this is pack three. Uh, I already had Overwhelm. I already had Sanctified Charge. So I knew I could finish games. What, what I was interested in was filling out my curve. I didn't have a lot of early, a lot of four drops. I got a lot of two drops pack three, pack three, and I think I made uh, an okay deck. But I was really worried about ending up with a not functional deck. I didn't want a deck that had overwhelm, sanctified charge, and soul of new Phyrexia. Right. You know, I can play Juggernaut. I can keep Alfing. You know, I can uh, sanctified charge. You know, I can make them trade with the over, the Juggernaut and then get in damage with my little guys, or they can eat a little guy and take like eight. You know, right. Juggernaut really kind of fit the other cards I had more. But I would say of the times I open Juggernaut and Soul of New Phyrexia, it's probably going to be 80%, maybe 90% that I'm taking Soul of New Phyrexia. Right. It would, it would take this set of circumstances. Right. But with like two-thirds of your deck already framed out, right. you knew that you needed something here as opposed to up here. Right. I, needed, I knew I needed another aggressive creature as opposed to another finisher because I already had a couple of finishers and my, my four drops and three drops were lacking. I didn't really have that great of, right. a, of a curve. Right, and even though you had and already it, taken a Juggernaut in the previous pack. And it's not like I have a control deck, and now I'm going to have a right. win condition. I already have pump spells, titanic growth. I don't know when I got it, but I have it. You know, I, I'm green-white. I, right. know, I know what green and white cards are in M15 and right. what it, you know what I mean? Like, right. I, it's not like, oh, I got the Soul of Nephrexia. Okay, now I'll draft some more controlling stuff and try and stay, you know, control the board and win with Soul of That's not what my deck right. was going to be. That's right. not what my deck did. Right. You know? Uh, so my, my takeaways from talking to you here, I'm always trying to, Get a little bit, you know, used to be that I was pretty good in terms of the coverage drafter pool of players, and Ben has sort of really just skewed the curve off, <laughs> <laughs> off the road. So uh, my, my takeaways here as I'm trying to, to, to follow in your footsteps here are that you're drafting with people around you and that you can sort of send some information that way mm -hmm. and, you know, make, make a pick based on the fact that you know you don't want to necessarily yeah, get into well, a fight I, with this guy. I don't guy. know if Sam's going to take, what Sam took first picked. I don't know what he's going to take. He, took but stoke, there, he had stoked the flames first. Yeah, so it worked out. But there, there are going to be two red players somewhere not far from me. Right. Because the first three cards taken out of that pack are going to be Triple Good Spirits, Conan Flame, and Seize Dragon a lot right. of the time. And even if they're not, then they're going to be three of the first four right. taken out of the pack because one person right. doesn't take one. Second, second takeaway for me is just know where you value all the cards and have them be able to go, oh, this is a five, this is a six, this is a 10, this is a nine. So you can make those tough decisions on the fly. Yeah. And then finally, that you're drafting within the context of your deck. Yeah, the third one is probably the most important. People, I think, see how good a card is on its own or how it would be in a stalemate, and that's just not limited anymore, like I was saying. You know, right. when, uh, your, your deck has a purpose. You're, almost, right. you're drafting a, like a block constructed deck, you know right. what I mean? Yeah. So it's, it's, it's like that. Okay. So, I think like once you have uh, once it's pack three, you should really be prioritizing what your deck needs and not how good a card is on its own. Awesome. All right, thank you. That was Pro Tour Hall of Famer Ben Stark, best limited player in the game. Get another draft <laughs> to go. You get another draft uh, to get back on the road tomorrow. Hopefully, I got to win some matches at Constructed to get there. Can't wait to see what you're playing in Standard. <laughs> uh, so for Ben Stark, Brian David Marshall, sending it back to the news desk and Rich Hagan. All right. Thanks very much to Ben Stark. Um, always tough to front up when you've gone one and two it hasn't been a great start to the day but still super compelling still one of the best limited players 
on Earth. Well, I can tell you that we're into our lunch break. That means Randy Bueller bringing you an overview of Standard. That means the first part of our All-Star Magic 2015 set review. You'll see white, you'll see blue, you'll see black. All of that is still to come, but before that, we have a very, very important announcement. So coming your way in about 20 seconds from now, it's the announcement for the Pro Tour Hall of Fame.